And y'all get ready because it's time. <laughs>
Praise the Lord. Hope you enjoyed that worship. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of His people. There's no reason for us to come together if we're not going to welcome the presence of the Lord. But I'm thankful tonight that that's exactly what we're here to do. I'm thankful for God's faithfulness. We want to say welcome to each and every one of you that may be watching us on Facebook Live tonight. Uh, maybe uh, you may see the video later. We want to encourage you to help us spread the word of God by sharing our videos. Get the message out there to as many people as we possibly can. Uh, that God is good and that he's still moving for his people. Amen. Amen. But uh, we appreciate each one of you being with us. Uh, Wednesday night is dedicated to our young people, so uh, our YWC. So if you want to give to the youth program here at Luke Waters Tabernacle, you can do that online. Um, or you can also mail it into the church at 344 Moffingo Church Road, Old Fort, North Carolina, 28762. I know that Brother Barry, Brother Patrick, and all the youth workers would be uh, thankful for your assistance in um, providing the activities that they do for the young people here at the church. But God is good and He's faithful, and we have come to worship Him tonight. Tonight's message is titled, I'm Still Standing. Somebody say that with me. I'm still standing. Say it. Come on. I'm still standing. Say it louder. I'm, I'm still standing. You got to declare it tonight. You got to say it with some conviction. Let's all say it together. I'm still standing. Amen. There was a song written years ago in uh, 18 in the 1800, 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. It's a uh, the verses of it say, standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fail, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. And then the chorus says, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing, and standing on the promises of God. In the Bible, uh, we find over and over and over that not only is the inspired Word of God, but uh, as we've said many times, it's a multifaceted book. It is a living, breathing document. It speaks to our hearts over and over and over, depending on the circumstances or the situations that we find ourselves in. It is very much alive and it is applicable to every situation in our life, no matter what that situation is. Something else about the Bible, it's loaded with history, it's loaded with poetry, all different kinds of proverbs, parables, prophecies, uh, biographies, and promises. And how many of you are thankful tonight that God's promises uh, are, are in His Word tonight? Amen. Uh, a man named Russell was born in 1849. He was a star athlete of the military academy, an outstanding student academically as well. You can find the same stuff on Google. Uh, he was multi-talented. He was an ordained minister, a musician, songwriter, and also earned a medical degree and spent the last of his professional years as a practicing physician. It sounded like he had a pretty well-rounded life. At the age of 30, he became critically ill with heart issues, and the doctors told him that there was nothing that they could do. He was already a Christian and got involved in the holiness movement by this time, but it was during that health crisis that he came to a new depth in his faith, and God's Word became more alive to him than ever before. He began to study it with a new zeal and an intensity like he had never known. That intensity grew. And it drew him to the promises of God that were set forth throughout the scripture. And he came to the point that he prayed, Lord, whether you see fit to heal me or not, from now on my life is completely yours. We sing a song here that was made popular back in the 80s. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am, everything I'm not, I'm yours. He said, and I'm going to stand on your promises. And that's when he wrote the song that we shared the words of in the beginning of tonight's message. Standing on the promises. Several years later, his health began to improve. He actually lived a full life until the age of 79. God doesn't always heal our illnesses in the same way. Sometimes it's an eternal healing. Amen? 
Uh, sometimes we see healing here on earth, but sometimes we see it in eternity. It all depends on God's plan for that individual. You see, we all have a plan that has been laid out for us. We all have a journey that we can walk. The Bible says that the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of God. And we have the opportunity to walk down this path. But we also have the freedom and the liberty to step off of the path. How many of us maybe remember a time in our life when we stepped off of the path? But thank God for the drawing of the Holy Spirit that drew us back closer to the Lord. Amen? One thing is certain. If we study God's promises, correctly understand them, and we rightly apply the Word of God to our lives, it will change how we live. It will change how we look. It will change how we look at the world. It will change how we see or how we envision our circumstances or our future. You believe that tonight? It's about understanding the Word of God. His promises, there are two different types of promises that I want to uh, talk to you about for just a minute. And then we're going to go into some reasons that God gives us promises. In uh, Genesis 9-11, uh, we'll get to that in just a minute, but there's two different kinds of promises. There's the unconditional promises and conditional promises. How many of you have ever made an unconditional promise to somebody? You know, I promise you I will do this. I promise you I will do that. But then we make conditional promises. You know, I'm going to love you all my life. As long as you love me, I'll love your life. It's kind of a conditional thing. Relationships don't work very well where one person is the only one that loves the other one, do they? The same thing's true with our relationship with God. If he's the only one loving us and we're not loving him back, it does not work very well. And a lot of people have the foolish notion today that it's only about God loving us. Listen, the Bible said that God loved us from the very beginning because he created us in his image. But it also says that he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it says that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but through the world, through him, the world might be saved. Amen. That's about him loving us first. There's an old song that I remember singing when I was a kid. Maybe some of you did. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. But at some point in time, in our life, if we say we are a believer, it means that we accept Christ in our heart and we begin to love Him back. How many of you have ever been in a relationship where you've seen someone in a relationship that was off balance? When I became pastor here, that was the word that the Holy Spirit spoke to me. It was about balance. In everything that we do, balance. Because people get off on tangents about things. And they get sidetracked. They get sidelined. They get off the path. They get far away from the truth. It's kind of like directions. You know, the truth is our directions. It's our map. The Word of God is our map. It's a road map for our journey. But the further away off the path that we get from the Word of God, the further away we get from the truth. So we've got unconditional and conditional promises. Genesis 9-11. And the words that God spoke to Noah and his sons after the flood. Maybe some of you have read that story. He said, and I will establish my covenant with you. I want you to say that with me. I will establish my covenant with you. Do you know what a covenant is? We've hit this a little bit here in the church in the last year or two. Covenant is a promise. God said, I made a promise to you. This is what he promised to Noah and his sons. He said, neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there anymore be a flood to destroy the earth. The Bible actually talks about that the next time that the earth needs a, a redo, it's going to be by fire. Not by water. Not by flood. Polar opposites. An example of a 
conditional promises. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, a lot of preachers are preaching from this passage right now over the past six or seven weeks. I dare say that many ministers have not either preached from this passage or read this passage sometime during their message. But it says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. How many of you would agree that our land needs to be healed? But do you understand what the first part of this is? There are conditions. We have to humble ourselves. We can't say, hey, I'm okay. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. Listen, if God is loving us and we're not loving Him back, there's a problem. There's a problem. How do we know that we love Him back? It's evident in the life that we live. It's evident in the things that we do for Him. You know, how does your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your brothers, your sisters, your children, your parents, your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ, how do we know that someone loves us or, or that we, we love them? By the way that we respond to them, by the way that we treat one another. Some may say, well, you know, that, that, that isn't a promise if it's conditional. I say that's not true. The Bible even talks about our sin is different. There are different kinds of promises, but there's different kinds of sins. There are sins of commission, those sins that we commit, those things that we do that we know that we shouldn't do. And then there are sins of omission. Those are the sins that we commit because we're not doing something that we should be doing. What are some things that the church should be doing right now? Well, we ought to be praying. And if you're not praying, you're sinning by omission. We ought to be studying God's Word. If you're not reading God's Word, you're sinning by omission. And the Bible also says, Fail not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Even in that evil, wicked day, Fail not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And I'm going to tell you, I'm having a really hard time because I know what the Word says. We're assembling together, but the Bible also says to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. It doesn't say go to the highways and the hedges and stay out there. His house is essential. His house is essential for His people. You have a family and you live in your house. You abide in your house. You dwell in your house. Psalms 91 says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide or live under the shadow of the Almighty. So I'm having some difficulties. And I just want to tell you, I want to Put this out there. If you're watching me, this is not going on forever. This comes to a close soon. Because we're coming to church soon and very soon. The people of God are coming back together. We've sat back and we've watched things be put on the church. We've heard about rules and Mandates that have been put on God's people that are absolutely unconstitutional, which means they're illegal. They're, they're not even legal enough to be against the law. It's ridiculous. People trying to usurp authority over God's people. I'm sorry to have to be the one to put this out there. But I say again, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And I say that every knee and every tongue shall bow to the name of Jesus. Those young adults that are a part of our church, we were talking earlier, the young people that are a part of our church, I don't know what you guys will have to stand up against one day. But you need to use this as training. How will you stand? How will you stand? How strong will you be? I'm going to tell you how you'll stand. 
It's by having this in your heart. Having the, his words written on the tablets of your heart. So sins of omission, sins of commission. We have unconditional promises and conditional promises. It's important to understand that some of God's promises are to be fulfilled in the future and some are to be fulfilled now. All through Scripture, there are promises. The Word lays out a description of heaven, a place. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. He's talking about a place of eternal hope. And that is the hope for all Christians. But we also want to live that abundant life while we're here that Jesus promised that that's what he came to give us. Amen? But I'm thankful for that eternal hope of heaven. Matthew 24, 6 and 7 says that until he comes again, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And he said that nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. It was about a time in the future talking about before the coming of the Lord. 2 Timothy 3 and 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. All this sounds scary. I understand that. And I'm not trying to scare anybody tonight. What I want to do is point out what the Word says. But I'm not going to leave you in the negative. I'm not going to leave you in the less than. Because we don't serve a less than God. Amen? We serve a more than God. Amen? Some of God's promises are intended for specific individuals. You know, God may speak a word to you sometimes, and that word is just for you. But I want you to know that most of God's promises in His Word, even though they may be spoken to an individual, they're applicable to all of us because He is faithful to all generations and He's no respect of persons. Amen? What that means is He doesn't love one person more than He loves the other person. And when he said that he has a plan and a hope and a future for one, I want you to know he has a plan and a hope and a future for each and every one of us. Whether you're sitting here tonight, whether you sang on the praise scene, whether you're watching on Facebook Live, God has a hope for your future. Either way, God's promises are 100% reliable. Amen? You can count on it. We can't always say that about man. We can't always say that mankind is 100% reliable. We can't even say that the news media, the people that are responsible for reporting to us factual information so that we know how to live our lives, they're not even always 100% reliable. But God's Word is. God's word is faithful and God's word is true and it will accomplish what he set it out to do. Right. Hebrews 6.18 says that it was impossible for God to lie. Isn't that beautiful? So if he makes a promise, it's impossible for him to break that promise to you. If you get a hold of something in your spirit, do you know what that means? That means that that becomes truth to you. It's like if somebody says, I'm going to give you this gift. And you fully expect that gift. It becomes true to you. That that is going to happen. They didn't say when they were going to give it to you. They just said I'm going to. And it became true to you. But you have to expect it. And you prepare to receive it. That's what's important about the promises of God. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Psalms 105, 42, 43 says, For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant, and he brought forth his people with joy, and his, and his chosen with gladness. Aren't you thankful that we were grafted in to become a part of his people, and he is bringing us forth with joy, and, chosen, and, and we are his chosen, so he is bringing us forth with gladness. Aren't you excited about that? I claim this as one of his children today, amen? God is the all-powerful creator of the world. He is sovereign in the universe. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, O oh Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. Nothing. 
So whatever is on your mind, wherever your head is right now, I want you to know whatever it is that's racing through your mind, there is nothing that is too difficult for God. The angel said to Mary in Luke 137, For God, nothing shall be impossible. And I circled that word because it's in both those passages. Nothing. 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 You teachers, y'all know what nothing means? Not a what? Not a thing. Not one thing. Not one single solitary thing is impossible. Not one single thing that you can think of is too difficult for God. That's exciting. That's really exciting to me. Because I can think of a lot of things that are scary. Things that are difficult for us to handle. How many of you have ever been laid in bed at night or maybe watching a movie or something and the lights are turned out and you hear a big bang outside and it makes you, it startles you and you jump and your mind goes crazy and you think all kinds of things. What could it be? It's a burglar. It's a grizzly bear. It's a mountain lion. It's, you know, whatever. A tree falling. It's an earthquake. Things that scare us. Things that try to evoke fear. But not one of those things that we can think of, not one of those things that we could imagine are too difficult for God to touch. What a promise. Wow. That's pretty good stuff. I don't know about you, but I kind of need this today. I kind of need this. You know where we are? It seems like the world's gone crazy. But you know what? Crazy is not even too big or too hard for God to handle. God said He's not the author of confusion, but He knows how to deal with it. He knows how to take care of it. That's exciting to me. Whatever God says, you can count on it with absolute certainty. I just wrote this down and had a star beside it. Promises have purpose. Why would God make a promise to you if He didn't purpose to fulfill it? It'd make no sense, would it? A promise that you don't intend to keep is a lie. But the Bible says that God cannot lie. It's impossible for Him to lie. So if He makes a promise, He has to keep it. So promises have purpose. What is that purpose? It's to go before you and knock down those walls. It's to walk beside you and cover you with His wings. It's to look behind you and make sure that something doesn't sneak up on you. It's to be an umbrella over you when there's a storm. Come on. It's to, it's to be arms that will pick you up and carry you when the road is rocky. His promises have purpose. And we're going to look at some of that here in just a minute. Some of God's promises are intended to warn. In Psalms 9, 17, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Listen, please hear me. I told you guys several weeks ago when all this ridiculousness started. People were panicking. You know, remember when everybody's buying up all the toilet paper? Well, you're going to make a sandwich out of it, I guess. I don't know. But when all this craziness started happening, I told you then, one of the things that really troubled my heart as a pastor was that people who had made, it, made a commitment to gathering together to worship the Lord would grow comfortable just watching at home. Because I'm going to tell you,
tell you, it only takes a little while to create a new habit. People like to sit in their pajamas and drink their coffee, eat their biscuits and gravy or whatever, and watch the service on TV. I said this the other week, and I'm going to say it again. I've heard many people say, maybe some of you watching tonight, or that watch this later, maybe you've made this comment yourself. Oh, I've heard more preaching than I've ever heard in my whole life. Oh, I've read more Bible than I've ever read in my whole life. I want to ask you again, what are you doing with it? How many people have you led to Jesus since you decided that you were more comfortable at home than you are in His house? Since you decided you were more comfortable in your house than you are his. I have a problem with that. It troubles my heart. I'm going to tell you why it troubles my heart. Because it doesn't line up with the word. It's not biblical. The world has tried to make the church non-essential for decades. That's not what my message is about tonight. That was just extra. We preached on that a couple weeks back. You have to go back and listen to it. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he chasteneth and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. What that's saying is that he disciplines his kids that he loves. I love my children, but when they were growing up and they misbehaved, I disciplined them. And discipline looks different for different people. Some kids you can talk in a strong voice to, and they'll respond. Some you have to get a little bit louder. They have selective hearing. Sometimes you have to take something away, something that they really like. I knew a little girl recently who wouldn't clean her room up when her mom asked her to, so her TV was turned off and her telephone was taken away from her and she got grounded. And you would have thought the end of the world had come for her. Because that mattered to her. How could she have handled that differently? She could have done what was asked of her and learned her lesson. You see, when we don't rebel against God, when we submit to Him, He doesn't have to chastise us. But when we allow that spirit of rebellion to take over, the Bible says that rebellion is as witchcraft. It's just like witchcraft. It's demonic. It's not of God. We already read John 3.16. And sometimes God uses promises to lead His people to salvation. That's what John 3.16 is all about. One of the most beautiful passages of Scripture in the Bible. But Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's hope for anybody out there. That person that has stood in your face and denied that God even existed. That person that has stood up and told you, I don't believe that God is real. Even for that person, there's hope. That's who Jesus died for. That's who Jesus came for. That person that has been through all kinds of trauma, that's seen, seen all kinds of weird stuff growing up, people that were off balance, Spiritually, y'all know what I'm talking about? That has driven them in the opposite direction instead of drawing them to God, it's driven them away from Him. There's even hope for that person. There's hope for you tonight. There's hope for all of us. I'm thankful for hope, aren't you? Some promises are used to motivate us even after we're saved because you see, this journey doesn't stop once we get saved. It's like a never-ending journey. It just keeps going. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Second Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7.1 tells us, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Remember the verse we read a minute ago? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Here again, we're hearing that, that directive to cleanse ourselves. But so many times people want to clean up everybody else while we stay kind of dirty. We 
all fall into that trap sometimes. But when we realize that that's what we're doing, what can we do about it? We can repent. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Promises can be used to guide us in our decisions. Psalms 32 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the ways which they, thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Remember, we talked about this being the, the year of perfect vision, 2020. He said he wants to guide us with his eyes. We need to see as he sees. Perfect vision. Our focus needs to be correct. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He wants to direct our paths. But in troubled times, when, we get, when we're tempted to worry, and we're tempted to be anxious, we've got these promises to bring comfort to us. Psalms 37 3 says, He healed the broken in heart and he binds up their wounds. Psalms 55 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Here again we see the reference to the importance of not being moved out of our position. We just preached a little about that Sunday. He's ordered us to be in a particular place, he's ordered us to stand firm. Sometimes to stand still, the Bible says, having done all to stand. Sometimes it's not about marching forward. Sometimes it's about standing. And we have to hear from God to see what it is that he wants us to do at any particular time. But this is encouraging to the church when he says to hold your ground. Hold your ground. Stand where you are. He's saying be steady. Be unmovable, be unshakable in Jesus. Amen? Sometimes we feel beaten down. Depression tries to launch an attack on us. But God's Word, it, it, His promises are used to encourage us and to lift our spirit. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for thee, or my grace is more than enough for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. In our weaknesses, His strength is made perfect because people get to see how great God is, not how good we are, but how great He is when He reveals Himself in our lives. Deuteronomy 32, 27 says, The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He's our refuge. He's our place of security. When you feel afraid, run to Him. Run into His presence. Why do we have worship? Because He inhabits the praises of His people. It gets into where we are. I know Jesus is in our heart, but listen, God loves for us to sing to Him. He loves for us to bless Him. And that's why we have worship. One of a lot of people's favorite verses, Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Remember, promises have purpose. All things work together for good. People try to figure out, how is this going to work for the good? How is this going to work for my good? I want you to know that His promises are yes and amen. And no matter what's going on in your life tonight, I want you to know that God has not forgotten you. And God has not forsaken you. He knows every single hair on your head. He knows where you are. He knows the very thoughts of your mind and in your heart. He sees your heart. It's exciting. Psalms 8, 7 says, The Lord will also be a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in time of trouble. Somebody say amen. Because I'm telling you, a lot of folks right now, worldwide, are being oppressed. A lot of things are taking place. There is oppression that has hit. And there are people that are behind it. 
There are decisions that are being made that are not for your good. And the media is trying to convince us, hey, just fall for anything. Remember the old country song? You got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. A lot of truth in that. But how far are you willing to go? How strong are you willing to stand? If you can't stand now, you won't stand later. If you're not standing now, if you're not standing up for Jesus now, you're not going to stand up for Him later. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not. So that's basically saying, Don't be afraid. Don't dare be afraid. For I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. You know what he's basically saying? Stand back. This is my fight. This is my fight. And people that foolishly want to come against God, get ready for it. Because you're asking for it. It just is what it is. Hope is not wishful thinking. And I put this in a star out beside it. Hope is not wishful thinking. But it is absolute confident expectation based on God's very own spoken words. It is confident. It is absolute confident expectation. It's not wishful thinking. How confident, how absolutely confident are you in the Lord tonight? How confident are you? What do you expect Him to do? Jesus said, that the church is not our hope only. Our hope is not only in this world but also in an eternal heaven with an eternal God. In Titus 2.13, it says the church should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 21.4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And the angel that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, the Apostle John, who was the inspired author of these verses, For these words are true and faithful. God's word is true and he is faithful. Amen. It takes faith to claim God's promises. Hebrews 11.33 says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. And 11.6 says, But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. How many of us are diligently seeking the face of God right now? Are we continuing to seek Him? You know what's sad? Is that there are many people who will not hear that question tonight because they had something better to do. They had something else that was more important. We have to understand that the faith God honors and responds to is not just any kind of faith. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in Him are yea and amen unto the glory of God. Romans 1.17 says, We move from faith to faith. You see, we get saved. Our faith is at one level. And as we grow and mature in Christ, it goes to another level. And as we face the fire, we're put through the fire. Our faith, and God brings us through that, our faith goes to another level. There's a shift on top of a shift, on top of a move, on top of a wave. And we continue to grow in Him. Romans 
Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how our faith is built up. So why do you think there's been such an attack to keep you guys separated, to keep the body of Christ splintered? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The enemy wants to keep you separated. But are you willing to stand? Acts 20, 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Supernatural faith comes from repeated exposure to the word of God. Do you understand that? A faith that supersedes natural understanding comes from repeated exposure to the Word of God. The first time somebody tells you that they love you, you might think it's sweet, it might give you butterflies. But after 50 years of them telling you that they love you, it's something completely different. It's a completely different level. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious or good. D.O. Moody said that he tried every way that he could think of to become stronger in his faith. Then one day he began studying the Bible in a regular, disciplined manner, and he said, I've been growing in faith ever since. Remember that we have to sometimes wait prayerfully and patiently on the Lord for His perfect alignment and for His timing. Don't come back up here to the music. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, Know in this verse that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of this King? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Then he goes on to say in verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant in this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes our hearts have to be in the right condition, the right position to receive the word. Because you've got to be able to receive the word before you receive the promise. And then there are other reasons that sometimes God has us to wait. Psalms 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Hebrews 6, 12 said, Be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Psalms 41, 40, 1 and 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of the pit. It says horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. The smartest thing anybody can do is link up to Jesus and repent. To let their faith grow. To live a life in agreement with God's promises. It's your journey. And tonight I ask you, where are you going? Where is your journey leading you? The life that you've been living where is it taking you? Is it leading you to that place called heaven? If it's not, then I ask you, turn to Jesus. As we sing this song,
just want to give you an opportunity, just a minute, to meditate on the Lord. On these passages of Scripture that we've read here tonight together. Is Jesus the center of your life?
appreciate you being with us tonight. We hope this has been a blessing to you. Let's just go to God in prayer one more time. Sister Kenzie, would you close us in prayer tonight? Father, oh, Lord, you said to come to you with thanksgiving, and we do thank you, God, for allowing us to be able to come together and to um, connect over the internet, Father, during this weather. And we thank you, God, that your promises are yes and amen. And we thank you, Lord, that we can stand on your promises, Lord, and that no matter the craziness that is going on in this world, that your promises stand. And you are a man of your word, and, and we can put our trust in you today. And Lord, as we have um, learned from your word today, Lord, let that be applied to our lives, and that we would um, apply it to the world, Father. Lord, let us continue to be your hands and feet. Lord, bless each one that is here and each one that is watching. And bless your church, Father. And Jesus, be the center of your church. And we thank you, God, for every blessing, for everything that we know that you are doing and everything that we know that you are going to do. In Jesus' holy name, amen.